contrary to popular belief, all gang members are not stupid. And I didn't want to go, I didn't, I didn't want to go to my grave as a slave for the men in the way. I didn't want my tombstone to read, here lies T. Rogers, leader and founder of the Blackstone Los Angeles. So they was, I was multifaceted, multi-talented. I produced movies, I produced television shows, I wrote books, uh, I started in plays, I started in television, I started in movies. I mean, it's, it's unlimited what I can do. Uh, my resume is quite impressive. You know what I mean? And it's not over. I'm still here, I'm still living. It's not over. But I didn't want to go to my grave as a slave for the minimum wage. In 69, it was a time when the Panthers had just fell off, dissipated. And the, the, the city life was laid back. Uh, you could get high, you could trip, you could be flower power, love, peace, and hair grease. It was, a, it was just a time of, of it was a mellow time, a time of cooling out. And uh, I had gotten to 69 directly from Chicago with the hustle and bustle. Because there's four seasons in Chicago, so I know whatever I need to do in the, in the summer, I need to get it done so I'd be comfortable in the winter. And that's something I'm, my state, my mentality was. So I was just on the go all the time, all the time, all the time, always going. What I found out is that people, are afraid of a man who acts wisely. And that tripped me. And I was much wiser than my years. And uh, even in the banging part of it, uh, we were in the, the sixth grade, and they would send uh, junior high school kids to jump on us. And when we got in the, high, in the junior high, they sent high school kids. When we got into high school, they sent grown-ups. So whatever it was, it was always something that was older, but supposed to be worse than we were. So we were smart enough to maintain it and, and keep our respect. And when we first came to LA, uh, you were in the area that's now known as the city, which Correct. Is where the stones are at. Correct. Back then, that was the early foundations of what later became known as the city. Can you tell me specifically about that neighborhood over there by Crenshaw and Adams and the Second Ave Park and, and those areas that we know, now call the city or the city? It's a uh, it's a historic it's a historic place. They've got old mansions and, and it's just, it's a lovely place. It's a beautiful place to be. Uh, we didn't know that at the time. You know, we, we wasn't aware of the, the value of the architect that was over there. Um, it's a residential area, which makes it hard to protect. You know, over here in the, in the jungle, it's kind of closed off. It's side streets and dead ends, and it makes it hard to travel in and out of here. Over in the bitty, you, you can go right through a street <laughs> and wind up on some other place, you know. Plus the boundary lines for the city was kind of jagged. You know, 7th Avenue was the cutoff line. And we run from 7th Avenue to uh, the Crenshaw. So it was that type of thing. But um, it was a beautiful place to be at the time. We owned a home. Most of the people over there are homeowners. It's not that many apartments over there. Now, the, the, the city was known, before the jungles was known, as a Blackstone headquarters. Correct. When did the jungles become known for being associated with the stones, and, and how did that, how did the area from, from the Biddy get transferred over into the stones? Can you tell me a little bit about that history of that early beginnings? I want to say about 71 is when everything jumped off. The gang war between the Crips and, and us jumped off. Uh, we were at Dorsey High School and Dorsey had what was called Jungle Boys. And uh, we hooked up with the Jungle Boys and, and actually made them Blackstones. But they knew about us and some of the Jungle Boys were Blackstones. So it was an easy confirmation, it was an easy trans transformation. And uh, from that point on, we were Blackstone City, which were the thinkers, and Blackstone Jungle, which was a stronghold. Now, in the early 70s, the, the Rolling Twenties weren't known. Although today the Rolling Twenties and the cities are like two neighborhoods that are adjacent to each other. When did the, the Rolling Twenties or the neighborhoods kind of get known to be associated with this blood alliance? I'm not, I'm not from the, uh, from the Twenties, so I, don't, I can't really speak on when, it, when that thing came about. But uh, there was a meet. We, we were on a big recruiting. I mean, just giant, massive recruiting. We had five parts. We controlled five parts. We were over 500 million strong. 
the police uh, came in on one of our meetings and we backed the police up. There's just too many of them. They had helicopters above and everything else. But to answer your question, we had a meeting with the twins and we wanted them to become Blackstone. But there was a guy by the name of Coco that I respected and loved. And Coco said, no nah, man, we want to stay twins. And we, we allowed them to stay twins. And that's what it's been ever since then. I can't uh, really give you an answer when they became blood or anything like that. Uh, because I'm not, I don't want to speak on it. But uh, it was relatively shortly after. I know we had a meeting with the Grimm and the Gladiators. And it was another gang. And uh, we had talked about becoming up under one envelope, or one umbrella all together. And uh, right now, to be honest with you, that slips my mind. But um, it was all about the same time that we came about because what would happen was the Crip would say Crip so vile and vicious that we had to come up with a word that we could say vile and vicious from the inside the juvenile hall. And we came up with the word blood. Well, one thing that's a trip is that back in 69, everybody wore blue rags and everybody said cubs. Uh, it was shortly after that, around 70, 71, that we really got into saying blood and wearing red rags. To go even further than that, when you went to, back in the 50s, when you went to camp, they would give you a red or a blue rag. Most of the kids that was there at first got blue rags. So that's what the camp was basically full of. And then you came in later, you got a red rag. And that's how the red rag came about. To explain the red rag, Red is for the blood, white is for the celestial stars, and black is for us. Now, I heard you mention uh, about the Robert Bilal beaten by the Crips back in 1972 at the uh, Palladium. I read a lot about it, heard a lot about it, talked to people about it, but um, you were here in L.A. when that went down. Can you tell me how big that event was in L.A. in terms of the gang culture? It was unbelievable. It was totally, totally unbelievable. We had... Uh, we had a robbery going with the Crips, and the Crips would do certain things, you know. But to beat this boy to death over a leather jacket in a public venue it was unheard of. It was, it, was, it was intolerable. And that's what made people turn against the Crips. Are you familiar with the uh, killing of a brim named uh, Fred? Uh, uh, 1972, I heard of a brim. I think his name was Lil Country. Yes, sir. His real name was Fred. Okay. I guess it was around the same time that Robert Bilal was killed. Yes, sir. Also done probably by the same same group of people. Was it those types of events that really got the Blood Alliance kind of getting well, together? Well, I'll tell you one thing is that perhaps they thought that it would it would it would set fear in our minds and hearts that they were the Crips and they would turn over a coffin or they beat you to death or whatever. That's, that wasn't the case. What it did was incite anger mm -hmm. inside of us. And uh, that's pretty much what happened. And reading some of the, the books that talked about the early history, you, in the interview you mentioned like Queen Anne Park and some parts that are really outside of what's known as blood areas. I think today Queen Anne Park is mostly close, closely associated with schoolyard cribs. What was going on back then to where you were able to, to dominate and control parts that covered such a big area to where now uh, it's, it's not as big in terms of now Crips now took over a couple of those areas? Well, two things that happened. We had a mighty, mighty, mighty reputation. And if we weren't, if we weren't feared, we were respected. And uh, that gave us the power to pretty much move at will and know where we really wanted to go. You know, you have to keep in mind there was an ideology of philosophy, rules and regulations in Blackstone. It was the first time that it was, un it was unheard of out here on the West Coast. And there had been gangs out here before, but none of them had the ideology and philosophy that we had. What had happened was uh, the gang banging had started and uh, we believe in being men first. So as a man, first you fight your own battles, you fight your fight. If they jump on you and you can't handle it, then you can come and get somebody. But uh, for the most part, you know, if you, if you get whooped, you just take a whoop. 
you know what I mean? What happened was, the guys would get to, they would instigate a fight and then run and get us for help. And we, at the meeting, we told them, well, what happened? The guy would say, well, I got hit in the back of the head. I said, well, how did you get hit in the back of the head? I got hit in the back of the head because I was running to come get you. So from that point, we didn't help them. And once we didn't help them, they succumbed to being crips. Now, when I read a lot about the early history of T. Rogers and other books, sometimes your brother's mentioned, and I think you even mentioned him in a couple of interviews and a couple of writings, and I've heard his name associated with the Blackstone early on. Can you tell me a little bit about how your brother, your brother was older than you? Yes, sir. But your name usually comes up more so than your brother's name. Yes, sir. What was the role that your older brother played in the early days? Well, my brother really, after we left Chicago, after he left Chicago, he wasn't really affiliated with Blackstone. He was a Blackstone in Chicago, but he had gave all that up. When we came out here, he was um, basically a hustler and a damn good hustler. And, uh, but they associated him with Blackstone because of me, because we were both from Chicago. Uh, I have another brother too. I have a younger brother that it behooves me because he's a Harlem Crip. Mm -hmm. you know, so I don't know how he, he did that, but I mean, he's my brother and I love him. The unfortunate part about it is that both my brothers got life. You know, my, my oldest brother's been in the penitentiary for 20 some odd years. And my baby brother's just been in there about a year now. But he's got double life plus 40 years. And uh, that's a heartbreak to me. That's a heartbreak. Thanks for watching StreetGangs.com. Please like and share the video you just watched and leave a comment below to tell us what you think. You can also watch two of our previous episodes to the right. Please visit the link to our Patreon page and support our campaign. And don't forget to subscribe.